Welcome to today's webinar resident series. It is Back to Basics in Denture Technology, Part 1, being presented by Dennis Urban, CDT, Director of Clinical Education. But I'm going to be turning it over right now to Adam Dreyfus, our Corporate Account Manager for University, Government, and Institutions. Take it away, Adam. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Good morning to the Greater New York Dental Residency Program for the 2021-2022 calendar year. Congratulations for finishing school and joining these wonderful residency programs. I am Adam Dreyfus, your Corporate Account Manager for University Government and Institutions, and we are so excited to be putting this on for the second year in a row want to let everybody know that this is for you. Um, we set this up that this is purely for residents in the greater New York area, for you to participate, for you to learn, for you to understand and just be involved. This is a, an exciting time for us um, with the industry growing and evolving. And please know that DSG NDX is here today, tomorrow, and for the future. So take it away, Dennis Urban, because I am so excited to learn from you. Have a great. wonderful day, everybody. <laughs> great. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. And um, you know, it's great to have to be back here for the second year uh, with these programs and these presentations. And this is always the most basic one that I show. Uh, and it's you know, back to basics on full dentures or denture technology, part one. And um, I'm going to give you sort of my perspective being a lab technician and specializing on, on, in full dentures all these years and, um, and the collaboration that you need for a success, successful case. So we're going to get started here. And uh, a little bit about me. I have over 40 years in the dental industry and dental laboratory industry. And um, I'm the director of clinical education for National Dentex, like uh, Jessica mentioned. I'm also the, the chair of the National Board of Certification in Dental Technology. And this is important because we promote education throughout our industry so we can serve you and the patients that you serve so uh, it's uh, we're excited I'm excited to be in that in that role so I had the opportunity to travel around the world since 1985 lecturing learning and, and collaborating with dentists and laboratories around the world and my specialty has been on the removal side and on the implant uh, denture side so with that we've come a long way with the uh, denture technology you know you can see here on the on the top left here and corner those are George Washington's dentures way back when. They were made of lead and whalebone and a number of other materials. And on the bottom lower picture here, the lower picture, you'll see a vulcanite denture. And these were made in the 40s and 50s with a hardened rubber material. And it uh, wasn't that aesthetic. You know, they fit well. It wasn't that aesthetic, but that's what they had back then. And then, you know, so we come a long way with these materials. A lot of advancements on denture-based acrylics, denture teeth, and digital dentures. And I know some of you have questions about digital dentures. We're going to have a whole separate presentation on digital dentures uh, down the road a little bit. But today, we'll start with some of the basics here. Um, this, is, this is some of my work here with uh, full dentures, as you can see here, with a, a nice aesthetic denture teeth, characterized uh, denture-based stains. Um, so, you know, our goal and my goal is when we make dentures for, for the, our patients, uh, the patients that we serve, the dentists we serve, we, want, we don't want them to look like a denture. We want it to look natural. We want it to fit very well. And... There's a certain protocol you need to follow for those successful cases and the success, successful fits. There's some more photos here. And this is a wax try-in, actually. And you can see how nice characterized, characterized wax up uh, I would do with the wax try-in, just to try to mimic the patient's natural gingiva. Again, this is a wax try-in here with all the carving, the stippling, and, and you know, it's just, you know, we have diagnostic wax ups for Crown and Bridge. So I like to give a nice characterized wax up for um, a denture case. And this is the characterized denture basis here that we, you know, we try to mimic. We can do this on, on dentures too. Uh, we try to mimic the patient's natural uh, gingiva and copy the, the, the staining and the color. And just so it doesn't look like a, a denture. But with the denture acrylics that are out now, there's so many variations of colors uh, that we can pretty much match that anytime. This is a pretty dramatic photo of, uh, this is a physio dentist denture teeth from Vita and a characterized denture base. And then we've come a long way with partial dentures too, with the uh, digital technology, with milling uh, metal-free frameworks. You know, we have, you know, but that's another presentation you'll be seeing too on partial dentures. But metal-free framework, with this type of framework here, this is, this is a mill framework, it's called Salve. And then we have our clear dentures here. 
which virtually disappear in the mouth. And all you see is the, oh, those denture teeth, those nice aesthetic denture teeth. No worries about metal clasp showing and things like that. So um, we'll get into that later on. It's down the road. It's still early. It's only August. So you'll uh, stay tuned for those presentations and uh, you'll be glad you did. So a little bit about digital technology. I just want to touch on this real quickly. You know, I'm not going to get into it that much. I just want to just you know, let you know that, first of all, more people need dentures now than ever before. You know, and our industry predicts a tremendous growth now through 2050. And this is a quote by Dr. Stephen Wagner, who's a prosthodontist. He says, experienced denture technicians are the guides for dentists and patient success in denture prosthesis. And professionals who understand dentures are the ones who understand smile design. And I don't know if, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Dr. Kristen Coachman. He's a world famous uh, clinician and he was a technician also. And uh, when I heard him say this at the Seattle study group meeting a couple of years ago, I said, you know, we have to, we have to really understand smile design because we're working with an intraocclusal space of 40 millimeters or more. And we have to fill that space with aesthetics and denture teeth and the correct occlusion. And uh, so it's really important to, to know that. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about that today also. So digital and analog. We still need to utilize the same fundamental prosthodontic processes to make digital dentures as we always have, you know, when we're on the digital side. But the clinician still needs to communicate and provide the technician with the necessary information for a functional case. And we'll talk about that information today. But I just wanted to mention a few things about on the digital side, because a lot of people have these preconceptions about digital. Oh, we just click on something, it's going to make a denture, and that's it. You really have to know the science behind what you're doing. And digital denture technology is still evolving and improving at a rapid pace. And the basic knowledge of prosthodontic principles, including providing accurate impressions, is even more important in the digital world because many details can be seen on a large screen, which cannot otherwise be detected. And dentists still need to understand the importance of capturing maxillo mandibular records, vertical dimension, and centric relation. And technicians need to continue to analyze ridge relationships and then select appropriate anterior and posterior teeth for the desired occlusal scheme. And the use of quality materials and techniques are always essential, and it's a reflection of your talents and skill. So let's just touch on where we're going to be in denture technology 20 years from now. And these numbers are probably a little escalated right now because uh, we're seeing more of an increase of what these studies were. You know, dental schools, manufacturers, dentists, dental laboratories, they're really becoming more aware of the growing removal business. You know, I used to be, I used to go to a dental show or dental convention and see everything on crown and bridge or restoratives. And now I see a lot on, on, on dentures. And, you know, the last few decades produced a large number of graduating dentists with limited exposure to the removable prosthodontic side. And, you know, and most students entering dental technology programs pursued crown and bridge in instead of dentures. So, you know, it was a different conception, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years ago about removable technology. So more and more people are getting involved in the removable aspect of dental technology now. And the only problem is, you know, we, we have these aging dental technicians who are great uh, removable technicians. So we have to really accelerate the training and uh, getting, getting more dental technicians into the removable side. You can see, you know, on the 40 to 50 year old uh, age range is the largest amount of, uh, you know, dental technicians that we have. So we're trying to entice more and more dental technicians to come in the industry. And that's part of my job on NADL and NBC too. So. So more income opportunities for dental laboratories, technicians, dentists, and dental manufacturers. So one of the surveys from Dental Products Report was, you know, 52% of all United States labs surveyed claimed they had an increase in full denture cases in the last five years. And dentists who would like to increase their full denture business, it was only 46%. Why? Because a lot of clinicians felt there was a lot of chair time, a lot of adjustments, and the comfort level just wasn't there with the, with the uh, on full dentures. And we're going to get you into that comfort zone with full dentures, Chris. You, know, you follow the guidelines that I'm going to show today, you're going to have success. And then almost 53% of lab survey, they said they had an increase in partial denture cases in the last five years. And that include metal, includes metal-free partials also. And the dentists who would like to increase their partial denture was benches were a little bit higher than the full denture uh, uh, survey that we see because they they the response was there was less um, adjustments in the office, but you know adjustments included you know occlusal adjustments, sore spots, and many other things that uh, really took a lot of, up a lot of chair time. But uh, I mentioned earlier there's a growing dentalism in in this country, and ninety percent of denture patients are unhappy with the fit of their dentures. So it's really important to get the, the protocol correct and use the correct materials. This dissatisfied, frustrated patients, it's you know, difficult to provide good fitting dentures at long turnaround time sometimes, but 
I didn't have that problem when I had when I had my lab and when I do my dentures because I follow a certain protocol. I use certain materials and the collaboration and communication with you, the clinician, is really important for successful cases. And of course, the patient also. So let's address communication between the dentist, the technician, and the patient. We have all these communication tools at our fingertips, and sometimes we just can't communicate and plan a case correctly. So it's really important, especially on implant cases. And we'll talk about that later on down the road too with our implant uh, denture course that we're gonna be doing. Well, sometimes all we hear is noise. You know, we talk, we talk, we talk, we don't really listen. So it's important to listen. And we don't understand sometimes the meanings of sometimes, usually, occasionally. These are fuzzy meanings frequently, quite often, now and then. The five words I hate hearing the most when I'm in a laboratory, is do the best you can, because that means that either the impression wasn't accurate, the bite registration wasn't accurate, or something's not right. And uh, you know, so it's a lot of times the clinician will tell us do the best you can, but we, if we do the best we can, it's gonna wind up being a remake. So we wanna get all the accurate information on the onset of the case before anything else. And for the communication on a dentist side, we, we depend on your clinical knowledge and training, the assessment of the patient, appropriate treatment plan, Detailed information on the RX form. And I know Adam and I were there uh, at a couple of locations talking about this. Now we really need this in detailed information on the RX form or the author work authorization form to have a successful case. Because that communication is part of a successful case. And a lot of that communication is on that detailed work authorization form. And we always like to get digital photography with our cases. You know, we want it to feel like we have the patient with us at the bench. So we have that communication with the uh, digital photography of the patient. Sometimes we go as far as getting little video clips on how the patient bites and go, goes into different lateral and protrusive excursions. So we know how to set up these denture teeth and what type of denture teeth uh, and cuspal inclination we need to set these denture teeth. From us, the certified dental technicians, you depend on our technical expertise and knowledge and knowledge of procedure and materials, the appropriate feedback to you on impressions, bites, shades, et cetera. And of course, we want to, we want to collaborate with you on case planning and all the other uh, communication tools that go along with it. So we, we keep in mind patient satisfaction. We look beyond just the articulation here at NDX and DSG, and we make each case a new positive adventure, and we wanna show all our expertise in their, all the restorations that we make. And the main focus is on the patient. So let's talk about the clinical protocol for removables, and we'll talk about the basics here today. And usually on an average, it's about a five visit uh, uh, type of case. You know, the first visit, is that preliminary impression. That second visit, we'll make a custom tray and you'll take the final impression. The third visit is gonna be that bite registration and occlusal registration. And then we'll send you a tooth setup and wax try-in to make sure everything looks good and everything fits correctly and the occlusion is correct. And that fifth visit is that final insertion. A visit can be eliminated if a functional impression is taken inside the occlusal rim and base plate at the second visit. And I'll show you what I mean with that by that in a few minutes. So essentials for a successful case, the impression, the correct materials, the right bite registration and shade, uh, shade communication is, is essential also and the bite. What about remake factors? You know, this is an interesting slide because the number one remake factor is, in, is uh, because of inadequate impressions. Number two is inaccurate occlusal reg reg registrations, poor shade communication, and the wrong choice of materials is number four. So. I think still the number one call in the laboratory to the clinician uh, is on inaccurate, inadequate impression. So it's so important for you in the, in, the, in the dental office, in the operatory, to really do a quality control of that impression that you take and look at all the aspects of that impression. All the anatomical landmarks that we need in the laboratory for a successful case, just make sure that's there. Otherwise, it's going to kill time. It's going to, you know, we're going to have to either get a new impression. Uh, after it's sent to us, we have to make maybe a new custom tray. It's going to delay the patient and delay you in the, in the operatory. So let's start with the first visit. You want to get a good preliminary impression. Usually with a good preliminary impression, we're going to make a good custom tray and get a good final impression. So you can utilize a stock tray, take an impression with a quality alternate material or material of your choice, something that's going to be accurate. And make sure you capture all those anatomical landmarks, even in that preliminary impression. And you know, if this is a great pr product yet, yeah, not that I'm trying to advocate any product, if you're gonna take an impression that's gonna sit around for a while, this is a great alginated material. It's called a five-day alginate. So you can put it in, the, uh, in a bag with a moist paper, paper towel for five days and it still actually maintains its uh, stability and uh, accuracy. So, 
So we have that five, that uh, preliminary impression. You send it back to us at the laboratory, and then we'll make that custom tray impression. And you know, we want to make sure that custom tray is accurate. And uh, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, in, in, in a minute, and talk about how to border mold correctly. So we use most of the time we're using a light cured material that are made out of uh, it's, it's a light cured material that we cure on in the light cured unit. There's other materials out there you use for, you can use for custom trays, acrylic, vacuum form materials, etc. But when I'm making the light cured custom tray, I make the custom tray about two to three millimeters short of the border. And the reason why we do this is it's pretty obvious because we want you, the clinician, to border mold these cases and get the best, best possible impression you can. So what we do here is you're going to take that uh, another picture here. We're going to take that uh, custom tray, put some adhesive on the border areas, and use a monophase or heavy body material around the border, or you can use compound material also. Put that in the patient's mouth and have the patient move around, speak a little bit and try to move their cheeks and capture all that musculature of the, in the patient's mouth because this is going to give you a good border mold and impression. And you know, many times we get asked for tissue stops in our impression trays. You know, and uh, this is good also because what happens is we put a sheet of wax on the model. It's going to give you some space between that custom tray and the tissue enough of that impression material. But what I find out what happens a lot is the uh, clinician or dentist is pu pushing too hard on the patient's soft tissue, and we get little indentations in the uh, and when we pour a model, and we have to relieve that. So you have to be very careful with these tissue stops. You usually have three on the lower, three on the upper. Sometimes I put four, and I want to avoid that papilla. If you look at that in the anterior region of this uh, case here, that um, tissue stop is to the right of the papilla. We don't want to compress that papilla. That papilla is going to give us all, a lot of information we need in setting denture teeth. Because when we're setting denture teeth, on an average, we're coming about eight to 10 millimeters out from the papilla. And then we block out all those undercuts on the model before we make the tray. This way, it'll give you room for that impression material and it'll be easier to take out of the patient's mouth. Preparations, I, you know, preparations are good. You know, we, we get, we get, get asked for preparations if we're making um, a custom tray that you take using uh, maybe a, a medium or heavy body material, but I find out that PVS material, a lot of it runs out of those preparations. And sometimes we even get asked for a custom tray uh, for a second preliminary impression with an alginate, for an alginate impression. So preparations, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, but uh, we, get, we get calls for it, so. So getting back to the board molding, after you put your adhesive on, put that monophase or heavy body material, like I mentioned, put it in the patient's mouth, capture all the musculature. This is a photo of using a compound material. A lot of doctors still use the compound material, which is fine. You can get an accurate impression with the compound, that's great. And here's your border mold here. And I don't really necessarily like the border molding material in the post dam area because we're going to be doing a post dam on the model before we process the case. So sometimes it makes it a little too deep the post dam when you're putting this impression material on the uh, on the post dam area. So after you do your border molding, you're going to get that impression tray out of the patient's mouth and put some more adhesive inside the tray and put your light uh, your medium body uh, and, and take a final impression. The only time I recommend a lighter body, really light body material, if you're doing a, a wash impression or a reline material, reline impression. So I mentioned earlier about a functional tray with bite rims and uh, to eliminate one visit. So this is basically a custom tray with a bite registration on top of it or occlusal rim. And you're gonna do the same thing with you, like I just showed you, you're still gonna board a mold and take a nice impression, but then you're gonna take an occlusal registration. So, uh, and uh, so you eliminate uh, one visit here, you know, it's an impression and a bite and one visit, which is great. And they work out great. So this is the final impression. This particular doctor liked a lot, uh, you know, some large borders, so full, full rolls and full borders on this case. So it was really, it was really um, border all uh, thick in the periphery areas, uh, but it worked out great, you know? So, and the doctor took an occlusal registration also, and we poured the models up. So these are models with functional tray and a functional impression. And the bite registration using a functional impression with therapeutically designed bite rims, it's one of the most reliable ways to transfer the oral situation to the articulator. And you're gonna hear me say this a couple of times, you want it to feel like we have that patient at the bench with us because all we really have is an articulator. So the more information we get, the better it is. Some wax bite registration alternatives, you can utilize the existing dentures if the patient's existing dentures are in good shape and you can board them all those dentures, take a wash impression in those and take a, uh, a bite registration at the same time. And then we'll get that at the laboratory. Sometimes we'll even have the patient come to the laboratory with these upper and lower denture or, or dentures that you took an impression. We'll pour the models, put it in an articulator, and then we'll give the, bite, uh, the dentures back to the patient. 
you know, or we can give the dentures back to the patient the next day. But this works out well because we, you know, especially for patients who really like what they have already, as far as aesthetics, their bite, their occlusion, and they want to mimic that, this is a great way to go. And that final impression, you know, we like to, I like to use a good um, uh, VPS material, should be high quality and better, uh, for better accuracy. And, you know, if a, I mentioned earlier too, if a good preliminary impression, chances are that that final impression is going to be accurate. You want to use a good impression material, something that's going to be consistent, stable, and accurate. And that's another presentation we'll have down the line too, is on impression taking. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming to you. So, and this is the final impression, nice, nice impression here. Good final impression here. We captured all the anatomical landmarks and the borders. And this is going to be a good case. This is an inaccurate impression. Look at this impression here. And look at, we see uh, on the lower, uh, on the, yeah, the uh, post dam area there, we have lower, uh, loss of detail from excess saliva. And those pressure areas, you can see that the, the tray actually showing through the impression material. And that's an overextension of the tray. And the number one thing I see here is the material itself. It's a heavy body um, polyether material. And that's and a lot of times if you have a lot of soft tissue, that's going to compress the tissue. And you're going to get sore spots and you're going to have adjustments and things like that, which you want to try to eliminate. So I would recommend on this case here, I would probably pour the model, make a new custom tray, make sure the borders is two to three millimeters short of the periphery and have you take a new impression. How about this impression here? This is an actual impression I received at the laboratory I was working, I was managing a few years back. And this poor patient, you know, the, the uh, dentist probably had the patient sitting back in the chair like this and the, the impression material went right down the patient's throat. And I just feel so bad for this patient. I, I, I kind of smile when I see this because I very rarely see something this dramatic, you know, when, when the uh, impression is being taken. But if you look at this impression, not only with the impression material going down the throat, uh, going down the patient's throat, but look at the left side here. It was never even border molded. So you got those extensions, uh, overextensions showing through on the custom tray here. So something like this, I would probably pour this model and make a new custom tray and ask for a final impression. But that, that's a lot of material that went down a patient's throat. They have four patients. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, something that, you know, we don't see too often, but uh, usually it's the opposite. We don't get enough uh, impression material. So uh, uh, it's a real quick story. We got an impression, it was about a year ago in a laboratory and um, it was full of case for a case and it was missing a lot of the palatal area. So it was like, it just wasn't enough impression material. So I remember calling the doctor. I said, doctor, I said, you know, we really need to get another impression. We need that, uh, you know, we, we need to have more, uh, more of an accurate impression, especially on the palate. And the doctor turned around and said, you really need that palate area? Can't you, can't you fake it in that area? I said, no, we can't. So don't even try to think about that. You know, try to fudge it, fudging it or faking it. We need an accurate impression for a good successful case. And it's only fair to you and the patient to do that. So here's a nice accurate impression, as you can see here. And what we do, we try to capture and maintain all those, uh, those uh, border molding and uh, the periphery that you took the time to give us. So we bead and box and pour our models. And I like to talk about this because just so you know the laboratory aspect of it also, what to use. So, but what about intraoral scanning for full cases? You know, you're probably asking yourself, you know, we have, the, we have scanners, why can't we use full, uh, full, uh, scanning for full large cases? Well, scanning is possible, but it's still not perfect. You know, additional steps must be taken and case selection is critical for, uh, for intraoral scanning. You can use an indelible pencil to help with stitching issues when scanning particular arches, when there are very few landmarks or reference, you know, that helps, you know, and cases with tissue texture and landmarks will be easier to scan. So, but we might want to make sure we capture all those anatomical landmarks. And I'm seeing good accurate impressions sometimes on fully edentulous cases with uh, intraoral scanning. But the cases I see, ha I see ha we have trouble with are those cases that have undercuts, especially near the retromolar pads or hamula notches, even in the periphery, you know, uh, on the on an upper. We want to make sure you cap capture all those uh, those uh, those landmarks because we want we need still need a good uh, good accurate intraoral impression, you know, with uh, with scanning. So there was a study done by Professor LaRusso and it was called the Edential Scan Strategy. And it was the design for optimal scan experiences of dental patients with three-shaped trios. And this is a great study. You know, you can go online and check this out too. And Dr. LaRusso had a special directional uh, scan that, uh, procedure that he utilized. And I'll show you what he did. And you can see on, on the left-hand side with his upper model, he would start on uh, the uh, hamula notch, go all across the ridge, they didn't go in, into the palatal area. Then you go from the periphery to the periphery and he'd capture its impression. He was very successful. Uh, probably most of his impressions, he did the same thing on the lower. 
you know, and uh, he had he's has a lot of success with taking impressions with, um, you know, intraorally uh, and scanning. So, but on the other hand, if you look at this study from the Journal of Prosthodontic Research, this is back in February, 2020, and a vivo a feasibility study was done and it's on computerized optical impression taking of a dentalist jaws of 29 patients. And the conclusion was that within the limitations of the present study, the investigative scanners were not able to currently fully replace a conventional impression for the fabrication of a complete denture. So they had a lot of trouble, they weren't successful. Uh, and look at the difference between Dr. LaRusso and the Journal of Prostatic Research. Look at the scan, directional scan that they did. It was completely different than Dr. LaRusso. So that could have a big you know, uh, impact on the, their final, uh, the final study there. So I'd like to show this just to show you that it can be done. You can scan an impression and send us an STL file. That helps too. But um, today we're just going to get back to basics with taking impressions. So after we get our impressions, we get a nice, accurate uh, impression. We want to make sure the impression is accurate. We pour the models up, or you can do it. If you're doing it in the office, just follow the manufacturer's recommended measurements with model stone. Usually a type three stone is recommended for full cases. And the reason why we do this, because uh, especially on immediate cases, because once we process the cases, <laughs> we have to break apart our um, the models and we don't, we don't want to break the denture. We want the model to give before the, um, the, the denture gives. So it's uh, we don't want to break that denture. And type four stone or high compressive stone is recommended for partial, dent partial frame models. And the reason why we do this is on partial frame models, we're constantly taking that denture on and off the model, that framework, and it's a lot of wear and tear on, on the stone. So if we do the type four, use a type four stone, we're not gonna get that wear and tear. So type three stone for full cases, as you can see here, it's a laboratory standard. And type four stone for partial denture cases, as you can see here, it's a resistance to abrasion, very low expansive and high compressive strain. All right, good. So let's make some bite rims. Let's talk about occlusion right now. So I, got, I took a picture of this at one of the universities I visited and you can see all the different bite rims on the, on the bench here. Uh, and a lot of them are not correct. You know, you're too high on the posterior region, the too, too low on the anterior region. So we're gonna talk about what the correct height and the correct protocol is for taking the flusal rest registrations of bite rims. So let's talk about that now. So you know, functions and requirements of an occlusal rim really important and i spend a lot of time on this when i'm lecturing and doing hands-on courses because this is what's going to give us the most accurate information for a, a, a occlusal uh, for a setup and um you know we need this information and we need all the required functions and requirements on this so what are the functions well a trial of base plate function it aids in the transfer and accurate of accurate jaw relationships to the articulator and base plates simulate finished denture bases, you know, and uh, we want that denture base to fit really well because it's going to help the patient feel like what that, uh, uh, pretty much sense what that final denture is going to fit like, you know, and it's utilized for seclusal rim and denture setup. So a lot of different materials you can use for base plates uh, also. What are the requirements? This base plate should be stable and rigid, accurately fitted and adapted to the model. It should have a thickness of about three to four millimeters, clean and smooth, and some doctors are requesting, you know, process bases, which will become part of the final denture. And what I mean for the process base, we're actually using the denture acrylic that we're going to be using for that final processing of the denture. And we utilize that. Um, and a lot of doctors like that because it fits like the, the final denture. But I, I'll tell you, the, the light cured base plane material, it fits very well if it's done correctly. So we're going to fabricate uh, that base plate. We're going to draw a, a line to the mucal buckle fold. We're going to relieve any undercuts. We apply a separating medium. And at this point, we're going to adapt that material and light cure. We trim, cure, and finish, making it looking and nice and fitting well so that you can capture a good bite occlusal registration in the office. And the placement of the occlusal rim should be placed in the anticipated position of denture tooth setup. And there's a couple of different tools I utilize for that. And one of them is the alma gauge. And we'll talk about this more in the on our denture setups, but the alma gauge has a pin on it. And if you put that alma gauge pin in the papilla, on an average, when you're setting denture teeth, you're coming out about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla. And I like to do this with the wax rim too. We try to contour these wax rims to eliminate a lot of excess time in the operatory for you. So, so the wax rim is secured to the base plate, sticky wax or molten base plate wax. We contour that rim to support the lips and the cheeks. We make a nice, smooth, clean uh, wax uh, uh, occlusal rim for you. And this will, this will make it easier for you to take that occlusal registration. So the occlusal rim function, we want to establish lip support. 
occlusal plane level and arch form. We want to record the maxillary mandibular relationship of the patient. This is when you're making a full upper and full lower denture. And of course, you want to get the correct occlusion also when you're doing single arches. And it's for recording the information for the proper setting of denture teeth. But with that information, we also need you to mark the midline, the cuspid lines, the high lip line, and the low lip lines. It's important that we get this information on these types of cases. So the upper wax uh, rim dimensions on uh, upper anterior wax rim from the periphery to the incisal edge should be about 22 millimeters on an average. The occlusal width is about eight to 10 millimeters. And we'll try to get this done for you at the laboratory, but sometimes you might have to ask, add some wax or take away some wax. And the anterior width should be about three to five millimeters. So, and these are the dimensions that I teach our technicians also in the laboratory. So, and now on a lower wax uh, rim, it's uh, the occlusal width is the same, but the, it's a, and it's about uh, 18 millimeters from the periphery to the, uh, to the incisal edge. And there's your finished wax bases, uh, finished wax, uh, um, base plates here. And then we're gonna put those wax rims on top of it. So we want a nice contoured wax rim on top of that so you can take a nice flusal rim. So just to review, the necessary information we need from you are the midline, canine line, and the smile line, and the approved occlusal plane set. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. You know, so all those markings on the upper occlusal rim is mandatory. Sometimes we don't get that. And I'll, on, the next, on the next um, presentation on part two, I'll show you what we do when we don't get that, you know, and we need to proceed with the setup. But for now, we're just gonna talk about the correct markings that we need. We can also utilize a rim former. And what the rim former does is you, you put this in the hamula notch of the upper, heat this, um, this, this rim former up, and you just melt that wax to so get the desired height. And you can do the same thing on a lower, about two thirds of the height of the retromolar pad, and then you melt it down to about 18 millimeters on the anterior region, and that's how you get your nice, uh, nice occlusal uh, form. And this is that alma gauge I was talking to you about. And I utilize this when I'm doing my setups also. You see the pin is in the capilla. And uh, then I came out on an average from eight to 10 millimeters. This is when there's minimal resorption. There's your contoured bite wax rim, ready to take an occlusal uh, rim. And there's another tool that I like to use, it's called the Colbeck template. And this tool is cool because it gives you the exact thickness on the posterior region and the anterior region. And it also gives you the correct height. And you can't see it on here, but oh yeah, you can see on this slide here. You now you have 18 millimeters on the lower, and there's little holes and slots in this, in this template where you can stick your bar park or a blade through there, and I'll give you the exact measurement from the periphery to the incisal edge area. So uh, this happens to be a lower, it's about 18 millimeters. So this is a great tool also, it's called the Colbeck template. And we, I hand these out to our technicians also because it helps them contour a good quality uh, wax rim. Okay, so we've got some time. Good. So, so on a third visit, uh, you, you, you're taking your occlusal records and make sure that patient is in an upright, uh, in the upright position. Place that occlusal rim in the patient's mouth. Make sure there's no interference with the wax base blade when the patient bites down. And again, mark that midline, high lip line, and cuspid line. And if taking occlusal rep records for a full upper and full lower denture, place those V-cuts in the wax in the posterior regions and then pla place by registration material between the upper and lower occlusal rims. And you know when you're taking that occlusal record too, you want to verify the shade with, of the teeth with the patient. And if possible, sometimes we even get the mold of the teeth sent to us also, uh, if you have a living mold guide in the office here, and that makes it a bit easier for us. But I'll talk about picking out denture teeth in the next presentation and what the guidelines are for that. So taking the bite registration, look, look at this bite registration here. I like to show this. This is another actual case that you know, you'd be surprised what we get in the laboratory sometimes. So this I got from a doctor, and this is when I was working down in North Carolina, but the laboratory I was managing down there. And uh, it's a full upper immediate denture, and the impression was terrible, and the bite registration wasn't that much better. So I don't know what kind of wax this used. It looks, was used here. It looks like beeswax and alu wax and had the patient they had the patient bite down. I could not get the opposing model to fit in here. And so I called the doctor and I said, doctor, I said, I can't, we have to probably make a new custom, a custom tray for a new impression and a new bite registration because I just can't get these models together and it just doesn't look right. And this is what I, I was told, Dennis, do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't do the best I can because it would have wound up in a remake. So, and what we finally did, start, we finally did, we made a new custom tray. And then once we got that final impression, we made a new by registration and the case, case worked out perfectly. So I want to make sure that I have all that correct information. 
So this is a patient sitting back in the dental chair and you can see on the left-hand side, she's struggling to get in that physiological rest position, you know? And finally we get her in that right position, but she still doesn't look comfortable, you know, cause she's lifting her head up, she's sitting back. So that's why it's important to have that patient sit up in an upright position when you're taking your, your occlusal, occlusion lab record. And, you know, want the patient to have some different phonetics, different, different sounds, go through the alphabet and make sure that the uh, length of that occlusal rim is correct really important. And then uh, this is an old photo. I'd like to show it though, because I'm just, it just shows you the information that we need on the, on the upper uh, closal rim. Yeah. So we're getting the smile, the lip line, cusper lines and midline. And it could be moved. You can add wax to it just to fill out the patient's mouth. You can contour the lips a little bit and control the angle of the mouth with the amount of wax. So. A lot of times we'll get something like this in the back in the laboratory where the doctor added some wax to that uh, occlusal rim, and uh, we know exactly where the incisal edge of the anterior teeth are going to wind up. So this is just a photo of the occlusal plane uh, uh, parallel to the campus plane. As you can see here, that uh, that occlusal plane uh, with that metal plate that the doctor's using here is sloping down. And the campus plane is from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear, it's equal to the uh, occlusal plane. But if we left it like this, you know, the patients, we're going to have probably have a reverse smile situation. So the doctor adjusted this occlusion by cutting away some wax. And now we have, you can see on the upper right hand side, we have a nice even occlusal plane here, which is perfect. And now we have a good, good guidelines to set up our denture teeth correctly. Plane of occlusion is really important. So, you know, we get a lot of bite registrations back in the laboratory with, you know, it was a little too high in the posterior region. And I can tell right away there's going to be a problem, you know, when we set this up on the articulator. So you want to make sure, also you secure that bite registration before you send it back to us at the laboratory. Uh, I have some old photos I'm going to show now, just getting, this is what sometimes we got the back in the bite in the laboratory with staples and they would move around, especially during transport. And then we, you know, all the trouble you went through taking the bite registration, uh, you, uh, you know, we, we had to, we had to fix it in the laboratory and, and actually resend it to take a new bite registration. So put those V cuts in the wax rims when you're doing an upper and lower wax rim and occlusal record. And in between, you could put some polyvinyl material, by registration material, or wax. So the articulation of the models has been sent back to the laboratory. You know, we mapped it on the articulator. You know, if it's a really detailed case, we like to use a semi-adjustable articulator, a fully adjustable articulator. If it's a full mouth rehabilitation case, then we definitely want to do a face bow transfer with, um, a, you know, a fully adjustable articulator. And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You know, I know this is a basic course, but I like to throw in that face bow transfer aspect of it also. So, so there's different types of articulators out there. You have your straight hinge, or they call it the barn door articulator. Uh, semi-adjustable articulator and a fully adjustable articulator. We really want an articulator that's going to mimic true jaw function. Something with a, about 110 millimeters intercondylar distance that we can mimic those, that true jaw function. And that's what we try to do on these full, full mouth cases. But this is your straight hinge articulator, which is fine for, you know, maybe a single arches or maybe, you know, partial cases or single crowns and things like that. But at least the semi-adjustable I like to have, you know, so there's magnetic articulators out there you can utilize. It's a little bit better than what I just showed you. This is a version one articulated by a company called Yamahachi, which gives you that semi-adjustable aspect of the articulation. And you know, there's so many choices out there. And then you have your higher end articulators, anywhere from a Hanau, uh, Denar, uh, just a lot of whip mix articulators. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, systems out there, you know, that we can utilize. So, so when you mount this on an average value articulator, I, average value to me is uh, semi-adjustable. So the occlusal plane is aligned and marked to the occlusal plane of the articulator and parallel to the workbench. And the center of the model is identical to of the articulator. And the incisal point is aligned to the incisal indicator of the articulator. As you can see here, I put a rubber band on the incisal pin, the little notch there. And most of the time on these types of articulators, you have the little notches on the posterior region. And when you utilize this, this is the occlusal plane. So you want to set up your models just, just when, on, when you're articulating to this occlusal plane. And many times we'll get models set up on an articulator and uh, sent to us from the office. And many times it's not correctly uh, um, mounted. So this is going to throw us off when we're setting our denture teeth. So just keep this in mind when you're setting these or mount, if you're mounting these in the operatory. So we mount this on the articulator. We have a lower mounted, then we mount our upper, upper to the occlusal plane. Campers plane, occlusal plane, and nice even articulation, and we're ready to set up our denture teeth. 
this lower denture setup down here, and then we follow the guidelines lower here, and we set up at the upper, and we're ready to wax up the denture. So we'll get more into this in the next uh, uh, when we talk about setting denture teeth. Nice occlusal record here, and uh, we had all the information we needed for a beautiful setup, and then we're going to wax it up for a trying. And we try to you know, visualize the patient at, at the bench with us, you know, like I mentioned earlier. So the pupil line is equal to the occlusal plane. Come two thirds of the height of the rest of molar pads. Usually that's where the second molar is gonna wind up and we're ready to set our tension teeth. And again, so we've got the, um, the ear, the tip of the nose, the middle of the ear, your campus plane, and there's your occlusal plane. So we follow those guidelines when we're setting our denture teeth. You know, because this could be difficult. You know, we have all that space to work with. We want to know where the guidelines to set the east denture teeth. And this is some photos that we get sometimes that the model is poured in, in the operatory. Sometimes it's trimmed incorrectly. We want to make sure that we, you know, we, we put a, a base on there. Or if it is trimmed correctly, uh, incorrectly, um, please, you know, try to do it correctly uh, because it's going to throw us off when we're setting our denture teeth. So we try to put a base on there. We've got a nice even occlusion plane now and we're ready for our denture setup. So we look at the Frankfurt horizontal plane, the campers line, and the occlusal plane. Really important. I told you I elaborate a lot on bi-registrations, right? So this is, this is important. It's one of, to me, one of the most important aspects besides the impression. There we go. The campers line is equal to the occlusal plane, as you could see here. Average about on a lower 18 to 20 millimeters to the anterior from the periphery to the inside of the ledge and 20 to 22 uh, on the upper to the inside of the ledge. I'm just gonna talk, the last thing I'm gonna talk about today is gonna talk about Facebook transfer. And um, I love a Facebook transfer when we're doing a full uh, full uh, mouth rehabilitation. Some people, a lot of people get intimidated. You know, we're here to help you too with Facebook transfers at the, uh, you know, and, and DX and DSG. Um, one of my favorite ones are the, is the Artex Facebook. And what I like about this is we don't, you don't have to send the whole Facebook to us at the laboratory. You know, so it is, uh, it's something called a 3D universal joint that you sent to us. And I'm going to talk about this today. This is a picture of me a few years back. My, my hair is a little bit darker here. I look like something silence of the lamps here. But this is I was the guinea pig with this Facebook transfer. And uh, one of the reasons why I like this so much is that, you know, it, it, dis, uh, it disengages from the Facebook uh, and uh, you send that off to us at the laboratory. I'll show you how we do that. The first thing we want to do, you know, we, we want to register the patient's maxillary hinge access relationship. And, you know, this is for reference to correctly position our cast on, the, on a precision adjustable, fully adjustable articulator. And it just ensures that the restoration of denture is, is, is made to the exact cranium access relationship of the patient. So the first thing we're going to do is say so you have an upper and lower denture. You're going to put V-cuts in those upper and lower uh, occlusal rims. Take a bite, regular bite registration. Take it out of the patient's mouth. Then you're going to take uh, some PVS material and put it onto the bite fork of the, um, of the face bone. And you're going to position it onto the 3D universal joint. And, you know, it's real simple. Take that face bone, make, make sure everything is in place. And once you take that face bone uh, transfer, just detach it from the, uh, uh, the face bone. And you're going to put this on a, a universal joint. And it's, it, it a universal joint is attached to the transfer stand. You can utilize impression material or, or plaster. That transfer stand is going to come to us at the laboratory, and you get to keep the face your face belt. You're going to secure that with putty or lab plaster, and you can see this is the transfer stand here. And what we do once we get that back at the laboratory, we position it onto the Artex articulator, as you can see here, perfectly art uh, positioned. And we mount our lower model. We correctly set the lower bite block against the upper bite rim, and we mount the lower model. And there you have the your face belt transfer. And all the information sent to us at the laboratory. So this is great for those fully full full mouth rehabilitation cases, especially with implant cases. I'd love to use this procedure. With that, we're going to uh, end our uh, presentation today. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Stay tuned for part two uh, next month. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Any questions? I forgot to put the email addresses up here, Adam. So uh, you can you can email at me at durban at dentalservices.net. Thank you very much for joining us. Dennis, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, as I say this every single time, I learned something new um, listening to you every single time you present. And I've been doing this for over a year and a half with you. Thank you. Um, this this year, this this course, I learned about the percentage makeup of, of laboratory technicians. And I see that you put that picture up of you in the Facebook to show that you're part of that larger percentage. So, so yes. good job there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, but, but on a serious note, um, 
we do these courses for you, um, meaning you, the resident. Um, it is exclusively for you to learn, for you to be engaged, and for you to take advantage of and, and, and really access this information. Please know that everything is recorded. It will be accessible via a dedicated website that you will all be receiving uh, in multiple emails that I do send out over the course of the month. Um, <clears throat> there was one thing that I wanted to clarify that we keep on hearing DSG NDX on this call. Um, and you've heard it, you'll see it in emails. Please know that DSG is part of the NDX family and we are very excited to be part of this large corporation, bringing you as many services and programs like this um, moving forward. I know that you'll all need to get ready for clinic. So please get, get ready for your day. We're looking forward to seeing you next month. And please know I'll be in your clinics real soon. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you soon. Thank you so much for participating. Have a great day. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.